Good morning. I would like to call this August 1st meeting of the Planning and Advisory Commission to order. If you'll please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. And before we get started, I would like to ask um, those in the audience and also my fellow commissioners to please all turn your cell phones off or make sure that they are silenced since we are recording this live. Um, we will, um, first I want to remind those in the audience and those watching on television that this is the first hearing of any rezoning, text change, or special exception requests that have been brought before us today. We will first hear the reading of the staff report for the case by the planning staff, and then we will ask the applicant to provide a brief overview of the request. We will then give the opportunity for anyone in the audience to speak for or against the request, and then the commissioners will have any needed discussion in the case. Once a motion is made and seconded by the commission, a vote will take place and a recommendation will be rendered. The case will go back to the planning and advisory commission or back to the planning department, excuse me, for their independent recommendation. And if there is a favorable recommendation, it is given then the case will be forwarded to the city council with two independent recommendations. If the planning department makes a recommendation for denial, the applicant will have 10 days from the receipt of a letter stating the denial to notify the clerk of council that they are requesting to be placed on the city council's agenda. The city council of Columbus will hold a public meeting, which is called the first reading. And the said council shall consider the case, they'll review PAC and the planning department recommendations, and they'll hear any discussion regarding the matter. And then council will make a final decision at a second public meeting called the second reading. We do have minutes that were sent out to the commissioners um, from our prior July 18th meeting. Commissioners, I'm hoping you've had some time to take a look at these minutes. We can submit these as accepted um, unless any of you have any changes that need to be made. Anybody? No. So we will submit these as accepted. Thank you for those. So that actually brings us to our very first case um, this morning. We only have two on the agenda. The first one is REZN-06-18-1169. This is a request to rezone 40 acres of land located at 9056 Veterans Parkway. The current zoning is RE1, which is Residential Estate 1. The proposed zoning is RO, Residential Office. The proposed use is a life plan community. Joel Womack is the applicant, and this property is located in Council District 6, Allen. Mr. Renfro, if you'll read us the staff report. Yes, ma'am. General land use is inconsistent for planning area A. The current land use designation is vacant, undeveloped. Future is single family. Is it compatible with the existing land uses? Yes. Environmental am impacts. The property does not lie within the floodway and floodplain area. The developer will need an approved drainage plan prior to an issuance of site development permit if a permit is required. City, the property is served by all city services. Um, no traffic impact. Um, the site shall meet the codes and regulations of the Columbus Consolidated Government for com commercial usage. There will be no school impact. The buffer requirements, the site shall include a Category C buffer along all property lines bordered by the RO zoning district. The three options under Category C are number one, 20 feet with a certain amount of canopy trees, understory trees, shrubs, ornamental grasses per 100 linear feet. T number two, 10 feet with a certain amount of shrubs, ornamental grasses per 100 linear feet and a wood fence or masonry wall. And number three, 30 feet underserved natural buffer. There was no response from Fort Benning recommendation or the DRI recommendation. Uh, we sent out 129 pro um, notifications um, one to a half mile of the subject properties were notified of the zoning request. The planning department received one call opposing regarding the rezoning. There's no additional information. Okay, thank you. Commissioners, are there any questions regarding the staff report? All right, if the applicant will please come forward and state your name and address and then give us a brief overview. Joel Womack, EMC Engineering, uh, address 3575 Macon Road, Suite 15. Um, like I said, the, uh, the plan is the, the planned living assistance. Uh, right now they're planning for 24 independent cottages kind of spread out throughout the 40 acres and then more one large building that will facilitate 100 uh, independent living apartments. 
with um, 102 skilled nursing beds as well as 48 apartments. The idea is it to be for a retirement facility to be there independently and as they progress in their life to have that full service there. So in theory, they, once they come there, they don't have to worry about moving to another residency or something along those lines when time catches up. Commissioners, are there any questions for the applicant? Mr. Kenner. Uh, th this is a question just for information. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, like with hospitals, I think uh, whoever the regulatory agency is, they re uh, the hospital requires some sort of certificate of need before they can build new new beds for a hospital. Do you have, is there some sort of a regulatory agency that uh, you have to deal with that establishes a, or agrees with a certificate of need or anything like not, that? No, no, sir, not, not necessarily the need, but the client, like I so said, they, they've done this throughout the whole nation and they kind of target areas that do not have this facility there and try and go ahead and, and put that facility where there is a need rather than trying to go through that. Okay. Any other questions, commissioners, for the applicant? Mr. Bollinger? Um, the and I don't know whether this goes to you or the planning, but it said there's no traffic impact. How how could that possibly be true? With the type of development that he's going to be bringing in, most of it being er elderly people, there's just the, the the amount of cars generated is going to be very minimum. And also, I've got a question that may uh, answer yours as well. When you say no traffic impact, does that really mean not enough traffic impact to move it from one category to another of road? That's correct, yes, sir. So there, there may be some There, there may impact, be some, but, but it's going to stay. If it's a Category C, then that, that's what it's going to remain. It wasn't enough to bump it up or down either way. Thank you. Any other questions for the applicant amongst the commissioners? Is there anyone in the audience who would like to come forward and speak in favor of this request? In favor? Yeah. If you, well, if you'll come forward and state your name and address. <clears throat> My name is Sam McQuag. Uh, we live at uh, 8880 Veterans Parkway. We have a common property line with the development uh, for the full length of the north side of our property, which is uh, give or take 13, 1400 feet from Veterans Parkway all the way to the back. Uh, we have also, there's a creek depicted on their application plan that runs through our property where we have a culvert uh, that was put in place 30 years ago. It's uh, basically uh, two 48 inch pipes with a, about a 42 to 44 foot run that goes under our driveway, common driveway for three houses uh, that live on that property. Uh, my mother lives at 8866, which is immediately south, and my brother's at 8850, which is immediately south of her, all share the common driveway. Uh, I got some uh, photos of uh, capacity for that bottom area uh, that depict the capacity for the water, and what concerns me is the retention pond that they show uh, on the south edge of the development, which basically appears to be around two and a half acres, uh, the best I can scale it. There is no scale on their rendering, so you just kind of have to swag the size of it. But uh, it, looking at that photo right there, it would be to the left, uh, the property lines approximately 200 foot uh, north of that location up the creek. These photos were taken in 2009. We've been there since 1988. Uh, to my recollection, this is the only time uh, the creek has been out of the bank on the head wall side of the creek. Uh, so, but it but it is a pretty uh, impressive uh, feat. This is this is the head wall side, and uh, you can't really see the creek uh, right there because it's it's actually running out. Now, a lot of times we do have water running in the creek from those from that low lying area, but never running out. Uh, this is running. We have a low place on both sides of the culverts to kind of work as spillways that are far away from the culverts themselves to try to prevent washout. And that's what you're looking at there. We're standing on top of the culverts now, looking toward the houses. And uh, this is back looking into the headwall side. 
looking up this photo right here directly north about 200 feet is uh, where they're depicting a retention pond coming to the property line. Uh, my concern is, is I, I don't really know the classification between retention or detention, if there's any difference. They depict it as an actual detention pond. Uh, I'm assuming it'll have to have a spillway. Uh, I'm assuming that it'll reach full capacity at some point, uh, some event, and, uh, and have to use that spillway. I don't know how the water's gonna be regulated out of that development. But the property is not developed now, and that's what it's capable of. This creek bank is approximately three and a half feet tall, and uh, it usually runs with that much water in it uh, on any given day. This is uh, looking from the house at the entire bottom. You can see the, the two little uh, masonry walls on either side of the driveway down there. If you look right at the center of the picture, mm -hmm. uh, water's running out on this side and on the other side, which is running uh, off the property that in this case would be to the right, uh, about 200 feet uh, from those abutments down there or from those masonry walls down there. All these photos are 2009. This is a more recent photo in March of this year. Uh, this is the, the head wall side. Uh, we've lost a few trees during the years. They fall or whatever, we have to clean them out. But you can see it's to the top of the two pipes and we got approximately uh, another 18 inch rise to the masonry wall uh, on that side as well. And, and about uh, maybe 15 feet from the masonry wall to the inlets to those pipes. Uh, looking at that photo, if you look to the extreme left of the photo, just past where that water's standing, uh, where that water's standing about another 100 to 120 feet is where the property line is. And uh, I don't know anything about detention ponds or retention ponds, but I'm expecting that they're gonna put it in that low line area there. I don't know how that works but uh, I can't get access to any actual engineering plans uh, to be able to see what they're actually planning to do there. My concern is these pipes were put in 30 years ago. They were put in by Alexander Contracting, and at the time they described them as something, uh, and I'm not familiar with this term either, but they described them as something that would withstand anything except a 100-year event. Um, and that's with no development. Uh, and we're talking about a significant amount of development, and I'm just assuming a significant uh, larger amount of water as well associated with that. Uh, I have lesser concerns about the actual environmental of the creek, you know, what will actually be coming in it, uh, things like that, which brings me to uh, their sewage uh, plans for the plan, for the actual development. I'm not sure. Uh, how they're going to plan to handle sewage. I can't get access to that or haven't been able to as of yet. Uh, so I don't know if it's actually into to the city system, if it's like a septic system, if it's uh, if it will require a pumping station. Uh, is there possible possibilities for overflow in that area if it does? Uh, I have those concerns because everything is downhill to that point well, this is the exhaust side, but everything is downhill to the point of the intake side of that creek. Uh, that's, that's later where you can kind of see what the creek bank looks like. This was actually December of uh, 2015, uh, and that's as high as it got then. Uh, and, the, and this was during the fall with no leaves, uh, not a lot to stop the water and things like that. Trees weren't growing, so that's a, uh, but we get a lot of water in there. You know, we get a lot of water down there, and I'm concerned about where the water from the development's gonna go. Primary concern, uh, secondary concern is uh, where, uh, how the sewage will be treated and where it'll go. Uh, I don't really have, uh, it, it, there, and, and, and there was one other question too. I'm concerned about the actual elevation of of the, the retention pond or the dam, uh, what, what we'll actually be looking at down there and how that'll be landscaped, but that's, I'm sure that's something we can address later during the construction phase. But Mr. Renfro mentioned 
that they would have to be an approved drainage plan before the permit could be issued. And then he qualified that by saying if a permit is required, in what situation would they not have to obtain an approved uh, drainage plan before anything? I mean, is there, is there, is, is that something that's going to be required before any development can start on this? Uh, will it have to be approved, and if so, by who? Uh, I, I, I think that it, there is, but it will be required yeah. in this case, and engineering will be the one who require it and either approve or deny it. Is that uh, when you say engineering, you mean uh, city. Consultant the city, the city, city engineering? Yes, mm -hmm. yes, sir. And and if I obtained a representative of my own uh, from an engineering firm, would would they have access to those plans? Before? Once they once EMC submits those documents, they become public record, and at that point, yes, you could. Okay. All right. And uh, and the last thing I would uh, ask is if I'll have access to. Uh, these proceedings online similar to what you sent me in advance of the proceedings? You will. Um, this, this entire um, meeting will be posted on YouTube and you can have that as well. Yes, sir. All right. Uh, I'm not opposed to the project. I mean, I think it's probably a good fit for the community. There's certainly a lot of people around there that I'm associated with that seem to think it's a good fit for the community. But I think it, without a doubt, should have conditions. Um, and that's my feeling on it this morning. All right. Thank you. It does sound like, perhaps, Mr. Womack, if you uh, and well, make. I can explain a lot. Yeah. yeah, I was going to say it sounds. Sounds if you'll come back to the mic because we he does have the sewage question and some questions obviously about the. Yeah. Um, um, in uh, regards to the storm, um, we're mandated to match the existing conditions that are now now we're in better. So the fact that you have that much water running on your site now, we will not increase it one bit. We can't. It's, it's blue book law. It's the Columbus UDO all the way up to the 100-year rain event. So like you're saying, the 100-year, the amount of inches that fall per hour in, in a 24-hour period, that's kind of what they gauge the rain event on. That, so we will be mandated to put the detention. If you put my slide back up there again on to show the site plan. We're in the process of surveying it now, so where we show the detention pond at now is just kind of us eyeballing it where the low area is. Yes, typically you put the detention pond in the low area, but we also, instead of making one big one, we may try to put smaller ones in different areas to catch the water and slowly release it instead of hitting it all at one area too. So we're, we're under the, the idea of trying to topo it all right now and figure out where the best little pockets are to make sure that we could capture it that way. Well, I think we're trying to get your, your site plan up. Give us just a second. But, but in regards to the stormwater, no, we will not increase any stormwater leaving the site now. So, so but that, 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 that's what we do everything on. The, the, the idea between the detention and retention, they don't want to hold water in the pond. So we're going to sit there. When the rainfall hits, we're going to hold that rainwater and then slowly drain it out to match the, the existing conditions now. And then it'd be a dry detention pond when it's not raining because they don't want to hold the water, have the mosquito issues and things along those lines. So they, they don't want to hold the water on site. I, here we go. I think Mr. Johnson is going to put your right. site plan up. Thank you. I mean, and the idea, I mean, like I said, everything was preliminary. We're, we're, we're assuming about a one and a half to, you know, maybe a two acre detention pond for the thing. But like I said, if we put it in multiple areas, and I think that's the old one I sent the first time. I think I got a newer one here. But they've already tweaked some stuff. Because we're not, we've slid down. We're not going to have two excesses here. We don't. <coughs> I was, yeah. We, we got to get you on mic, so hang on one second. I'll slide back over. What is the dash flat line is depicted? That is a buffer that we're staying away from. And, and, and there again, since that is a state water, the, the county makes you have a 50 foot buffer. It's, it's a 20 foot buffer, and then the county enforces another 25 foot buffer. 
So wherever that rest of the vegetation line is, we have 50 foot that we're staying away from that no matter what. So you're, you're, you have an additional buffer on that stream where it is. So that's us kind of figuring out where that buffer may be at. That's the area that we're going to stay out of. Um, the idea is to have as much landscape buffer uh, as much landscape buffer around the property as possible because it, we want it to feel like it's kind of enclosed that we're not imposing on anybody along those lines. Um, and like I said, the we, we, we slid it. Can you slide it down? We'll just, just so we can start the entrance. Because we're trying to, there's a little overlook areas where the idea is maybe put a little pockets in there to the uh, right of the drive to make sure that we, that we could reduce the size of that detention pond down there. So we're not having all the water going to one location. So we're trying to capture it in different little pockets and slowly release it that way. Like I said, in this one, we slid the, the drive down as far as away from um, the veterans intersection as possible, just so you had more stacking more, and more time to react and things along those lines. Um, we are in talks with forestry to talking about maybe trying to thin out that little site distance area a little bit there just to make sure that you have plenty of site distance at the intersection of uh, Pierce Chapel and Veterans because it is kind of a, a sharp angle right there. It's not the most, it's very wooded. I mean, it's, it's not very clean at all. So we're trying to talk with forestry on that aspect of it all just to see what they'll allow us to do on that by still meeting the zoning requirements for that, uh, over, that overlay area. Thank you. I think Mr. King has got a, a comment or a question. Well, I, I did. I did go by the property and looked at it, you know, from the road. But what's in there now? Is it off forestation, or is it any flat areas that are clear? And no, it's all. It's all. It's all completely wooded. Okay. All right, Mr. Kenner has a question. Yeah, there, there was a question raised uh, about the sewage. Uh, the uh, staff report said that uh, the site is uh, serviced by city. By, uh, city. The city is, mm -hmm. is that true? So this will go into a, a sewage system that goes to the plant. We're, we're in talks with Columbus Waterworks right now. They have they're budgeted to extend that main that's feeding up that system now. It's in, they've already had it budgeted. We're just in talks with them now to see if we can make it faster by helping out with our parcel of land. But it, the Columbus Waterworks has budgeted to extend that sewer service up there. But the point is, you're not on septic. I think is what the question is. The, the goal is not to be on septic. Correct. Yeah, we would we would e either pump it. But if we didn't have gravity there, we would have to put in some sort of a lift station and, and, yeah. and service it to the That's nearest location. That's to be location. determined. Yeah, yeah, okay. So um, you're going to have, you're going to be connected to the sewer system somehow before you go operational then? Yes, sir. Any other questions or comments? Mr. Bollinger. Um, in the setup of this site, are you looking at clear cutting this entire piece and then replanting, or are you going to leave the existing? We, based on terrain, we want to leave as much of the existing as possible. That's what we're saying. That's so that this buffer would be what's existing. You would not pretty much. Like I say, we were talking with the forester to see if we couldn't clear maybe a little bit of the underbrush. Not clear it, but just kind of so that you can kind of see out. through a little bit. I mean, we don't. We don't want everybody seeing through there, and we want to have that buffer to veterans so that the noise and things along those lines, you're not going to come to that. But we to see if we couldn't have a little couple windows of blips through so that you can actually see through there so it's not completely forested. And I guess for planning, my understanding is that that overlay, there's a certain size tree that you're not allowed to cut down without some sort of approval. Is that correct? That's correct. And okay. they would have to go through forestry to, to, okay. to, for that to be approved. Thank you. Any other questions or comments regarding yes, real, this? Real quick, Madam Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Warbeck, I, I drove by the area as well, and I think this will be a great development for the area, and I think you're in a good position because your neighbors, act, he said he supported. Yes, sir. He just have a few concerns. Mm -hmm. And I just simply want a, a public commitment that you're going to work with Mr. McQuack because <laughs> we just recently saw the families in Alabama who private re resident driveway washed away, and they were stranded for a while. And I would not want that to happen to these guys. Like I said, I mean, you haven't seen anything because we're in the preliminary stages of everything. Right. We haven't designed, like I so said, we're just now getting it surveyed. I mean, at any point, you want to kind of see the idea. We're, we're, like I said, as soon as we submit to the city, it's open records anyways. We're not going to be hiding anything. Look, we can show you, you're talking about getting your own engineer. We can provide our hydraulic reports and everything, showing every kind of runoff that we're doing. Yeah, but we don't even know what our capacity is. Well, okay, I'm not, let me, we, we can't have dialogue off mic. So okay. if we're going to dialogue, I need you both up on the mic. But I think, we're, I think we've pretty much got what we need at this point. Yeah. Um, yeah one of the reasons that I was looking for an, an engineer to, to look at these plans is we don't know what capacity we have now. Right. Uh, with, with, the, with the culvert that we have. Obviously, it's got 30 years of wear and tear on it. Sure. Uh, you know, it had, it had a, an, un, an unformed uh, 
concrete face wall on it, but it's deter it's deteriorated as well. We've lost a couple of trees there, and pulled some of it up, uh, and some other things. So, uh, you know, we, we don't know what our capacity is. We don't know the actual condition <coughs> of the culvert itself. You know, from a professional standpoint. Uh, so, so those are some things that I would love to know that we would be working with a developer on. Uh, as far as possible inspections, how much water is going to come down through there and things like that. Like said, right. that yeah, like I said, we, we would be matching or embedding of course. our parcel. I, that's what I got. I mean, I could, I could guarantee that part of it. I mean, I, yeah. the, the other parcels that are feeding upstream from that goes up under Pierce Chapel or that creek, I don't know. I mean, that, that's how, the same applies to them when they develop their land. They, it, you can't see any more than what you've been seeing now. Right. Thank you. Anything else on, on this arena? I've not, I've yet to ask if there was anybody in the audience who was opposed. So if there is anyone in the audience who is opposed to this, um, Thank you. Mm -hmm. please come forward, but I don't think we've got anybody. All right, commissioners, any other questions for the applicant or any other discussion? And if not, do I hear a motion? I'll Mr. Motion. King. Oh. Okay, I don't know if you had a question or not. Case of REZN 0618-169, request to rezone 40 acres of land located at 9056 Veterans Parkway. Uh, I, I move that we uh, approve this request. Uh, and do I hear a second, Mr. Bollinger? Okay. All of those in favor, please raise your right hand. And it is unanimous, so we will submit this um, as a recommendation for approval. Thank you um, for coming forward with that. That brings us to our next case, which is REZN-07-18-1397, and this is a request for a text amendment to amend the text of the Unified Development Ordinance, also known as the UDO, in regards to adding Section 4.9, short-term rentals. Mr. Renfro. Yes, ma'am. Um, the summary of this is right now we, we're trying to manage the Airbnb craze that is going on. Um, so we just want to get ahead of it. Um, Director Hutchinson is going to come forward and speak more about that. Okay, wonderful. So if you will just do me a favor and identify yourself for the public. All right, John Hutchinson, Director of Inspections and Codes. Thank you. Um, I'm going to kind of rebrief on uh, using the uh, council presentation we did July 10th to kind of highlight the over oversight and then any questions you all have we can we can go from there um, ideally the intent is for the short-term rentals to be an accommodation for transient guests um, either in the primary structure or any approved accessory dwelling provided lodging for a period of time not to exceed 30 consecutive days um, so anytime up to that point if it's over 30 days and there's typically rental agreements and things like that, so we're not getting into that. So it's any, any time under 30 consecutive days. Um, the requirements that, that we would like to set forth is that they would completion of a short-term rental permit application. Do they have a copy of this? No? Okay. I, have it. I can put it up on the thing. Um, completion of a short-term rental permit application, um, completion of a criminal background check, um, obtaining a valid business license, and then they would be um, required to renew the permit annually. So as they would have to come into our office, especially for the 24-hour um, contact person or whatever management agency that may be running it, or if the owner is doing it themselves, we request that they come in every year to renew. So we make sure we have a constant uh, data and it's current and we know what's going on. All right. Um, well, there's a copy there. Um, and we'll go through kind of quickly what's on there. So we have the property address, you have the type of building, whether it's residential, single family, multifamily, if it's a duplex, if it's an apartment or multifamily, if it's a condo or an approved accessory dwelling. Um, approved accessory dwellings have to be a detached structure, no more than 1,000 square feet, um, and it has to have at least an acreage already, at least an acre or more already. Um, we have some that are grandfathered in, and we have some in the historic district or some that are in Lake Bottom that are grandfathered that don't meet that requirement, and they already have detached cottages, and those would be eligible as well. Um, and then the type of rental is either a partial dwelling, if somebody wants to rent out a bedroom or their basement or however, or if they wanted to do the full house rental, that would also be um, approved on the application. Um, on the application, like I said, we're asking for the applicant, the owner, 
the 24-hour contact person, and how the property is registered. So we know what site they're using, whether it's Airbnb or Verbo or HomeAway or anything else. So to make sure that we can we can track that type of information. Um, on on the kind of the code in code side is that we wanted to make sure that these individuals attest to these certain things that they have to have a certain level of insurance um, that smoke detectors fire extinguishers exits and escape plans are provided and on site that they comply with any standards for property maintenance codes you know that's not run down or missing utilities things like that um, no unpaid obligations or liens or taxes for the city so if they owe property taxes or anything like that we make sure that they're current on all that kind of information and if a renter, because like I said, we, we can't necessarily tell them that they shouldn't sublease. We know they shouldn't, but to be able to know that information, we will ask them to make sure that they bring us consent. If they're not listed as the owner of the property when we go to the site and check it, to make sure that they have consent from that property owner to do what they're doing. So if they are um, renting a house from somebody and then they want to sublease a, a bedroom in that house, we make sure that that property owner is notified that they know that that's going on in that property before we'll accept the application. Um, the short-term rental agent, um, that person is available to handle problems. So if we get any noise complaints, anything like that, that's the person because we have that 24-hour contact person which will be shared with local authorities, police department, all that kind of stuff. So if it is after hours, they know the person they need to contact. So that's why we wanted to do the yearly renewal so we can make sure we keep that information current. John, quick question. Um, back to that, that lease um, component of the subleasing. Uh, yes, that's found oftentimes in leases, but, but What's the concern here, the reason you feel the need to enforce that? Wouldn't that be the owner's well, responsibility? Well, say like an apartment complex and somebody wants to sublease an apartment comp, their apartment room. We've seen them on there that people be in Whisperwood or other places and we're like, it'll be like downtown loft and it'll be like Johnson Mill Lofts and we're like, well, you're not supposed to be doing that as a sublease of your master agreement with yeah you I understand know. it's a violation so, of the lease but correct. What, why is it the city's business why well, is that not between because the we don't want to authorize something that's violating another law if you you're see. giving a permit for someone yeah, I'm giving to them a permit to do that and then the the owner of that apartment complex comes back to us and say hey why are you allowing them to run the Airbnb or permitting them to do an Airbnb in that location when it violates the lease mm -hmm. so we're just trying to cover ourselves to make sure anything that's happening in that situation. Okay. Because of per a because of thought. permit issues. That's if that's you weren't correct. if you weren't requiring a permit to be purchased. That's correct. Then it so really, what we're, what we're, what you're saying is that only real homeowners are the ones that the true mortgage owner or holder or the property owner is the person that can engage in these type type activities. That's correct. Okay. Um, so like I said, the duties of the short term, um, uh, the rental agent. Like I said, they'll be able to receive and accept service of any notice of violation. So if we get a noise complaint or a trash complaint, solid waste complaint, any kind of stuff like that, that 24-hour contact person will be their legalized agent. So therefore, if we have issues and we have to issue citations, that's who will be receiving the citation. Um, regulation procedures, um, like I said, the Visitors Bureau is kind of running the, 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 the oversight to kind of help us track these down so they will be the ones checking you know all the different websites to see who that is because um, ideally we we personally don't have the personnel because if you've been on Airbnb in these sites until you actually book the room you don't know where exactly the street is it's kind of a general area so they'll kind of be able to be our eyes on the ground to help us with that but because the visitor bureau is not a part of us they can't be an official enforcement arm but they'll help us with the complaints Typically, we get these anyway, um, not necessarily for this, but say if we do COs or any other type of business license, we get people telling on each other, hey, so-and-so's over here renting their place, and so we'll, we can, we'll use that network to be able to proceed with that. Um, the CPB, as well as us, will maintain a file of all short-term rental locations, and like I said, their job is to help us advise the city of any additions. So as we know that people may come on that we are not aware of, then we'll go out there and give them a um, time frame, which is they need to come in and make sure that they, they come in and get, get an application. Um, so the way we have it listed right now is three violations within a 12-month period, and the permit will be revoked for a period of 12 months. Um, any previous violation of building, health, or life safety codes provisions, the owners must demonstrate compliance. So if we go out there and in investigating that they don't have the permit, any of these um, the things that they attested to that they don't if they you know they got a hole in the roof or they got something else that's not working we will also hold that until make sure those things are corrected before we allow them to to reopen or continue 
Um, ideally here, what we wanted to do is create a first time, um, typically any violation of the UDO or any codes goes to recorder's court, and typically there is not a uh, fee number or a fee attested to it, and we wanted to make sure that there is a minimum fine for people who assume they would try to get away with this kind of stuff. Because sometimes you can go to recorder's court and it's kind of at the judge's discretion, but we want to make sure we had a set fee to start. So that's why we chose the 500 on the first violation, 750 on the second within those 12 months, and the third violation over 1,000. Um, we also have the rule to, you know, we can override that and just go ahead and pull it if it's an egregious violation, if it's something major that's happened or happened at that site or happened as a part of the Airbnb, some type of burglary or anything crazy like that, we could just go ahead and just revoke it, period. We wouldn't necessarily have to go through the step process. Um, the appeal to uh, the appeal process would be to the city manager, authorized agent, me. So we'll just have to deal with that as it as it as it comes through. Um, taxes. That's why I have Yvonne here in case y'all have any questions on this. These are the, all the taxes once we have a license for them that they would be required to pay. And that was the timeline um, getting to you guys. Um, we got the dates mixed up, but intent is to go August 14th for the first reading to the UDO with you guys as approval. Any questions? 28th, I'm sorry. Any questions, commissioners? Um, I have Mr. one. Mr. Dudley. Early on, you explained what all the applicant would have to do as far as paying for the permit and the background check and so forth. What would the total cost of doing all that be to the applicant? Um, the, the permit itself would be $40. Right. There's a $20 permit fee for each background check. So okay. each per so if you have say if you have your your applicant which is the owner you have the owner information and the 24 hour person if that's all three different people that would be twenty dollars plus the forty of the permit itself because we're recouping the cost so for the, twenty for each of the so sixty bucks so it'd be sixty case. plus yeah. the forty would be a hundred dollars right. if it's all right, different. right. all points hundred or less correct. And then there are no other costs that the applicant would have to incur. Now it'd be a yearly An renewal fee. Renewal. So as you come in, it would yeah. be another hundred dollars if those right. same three people we have to check right. your background again, and we'd go through the uh, permit application again. Okay. Oh, yeah. yeah. First the cost and your of the business, business license. license. Okay. Good point. And how much is that? Uh, business business license, license is how much? My name is Yvonne Ivy, and I'm with the finance department, occupation tax section. The administrative fee, the process, the business license is going to be $75, and it's on a calendar year basis. So therefore, that license will expire as of 1231 of that year, and they have until April 1 of the following year to renew it. They also have to report to us, um, in order to renew it, they have to uh, file an occupation tax return in which they have to report to us the amount of revenue that they generated, and we tax on gross receipts. The amount of revenue that they generated in the, um, in the prior year and what they think they're going to do in the current year and that will determine how much they have to pay to renew. Now currently the tax rate for lodging, transits, or hotel operators is $3.21 per thousand on their taxable gross receipts. Therefore they would still fall within that uh, same tax class and tax rate. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Commissioners, any other questions or comments for the applicant? I don't see any. I do. I, I yes. have one. Yes. Quick. Mr. Um, Greenblatt. And this is just a, a I guess a personal thing, if, if my brother-in-law's house burns down and I move him into my house or I move him into a cottage that I've got and he pays, you know, a substantial amount of rent, do I have to have this permit? No, this is short term for 30 days or less. So if it's it something- They say he burned down and he's gonna be there for 25 days. I mean, are you, and he's compensating you? Yeah, I mean, he's I, helping pay the expenses and- Okay. Um, if we were to treat them like we do other hotelers, anyone who um, has to, due to a casualty, such as a fire or um, disaster, natural disasters, thank you, we do allow hotel lodging operators to exempt the gross receipts that they, um, that they generate from that, um, from that renter because of that na um, natural uh, casualty that just took place. And there is an exemption worksheet that we attach to our uh, hotel motel excise tax form. So therefore, if you, if your brother-in-law, if he has to, go ahead. You're going well beyond. I, I, I don't I'm have sorry. A I, don't, I don't have a permit. I, I think. I never extended to having a permit, but my brother-in-law's house burns down. Uh -huh. I move him in, 
and he's helped me pay the expenses for 21 days while his house is being renovated. But you're not advertising as an Airbnb or a hotel, and I think isn't that the difference here? I mean, with this it, it, this is that's to, what I'm asking is it, you yeah. know, because you're saying that if I'm renting, I still have to have a permit. That's it's Does that's what this says. Right. Okay. It doesn't say about advertising. So it I got says you. That if I'm that if I'm renting, I got I have you. To have a permit. No, I got you. So even though we up here may know the distinction is you're advertising as an Airbnb, what you're saying is there's nothing in writing there's to nothing. differentiate you right. from an Airbnb yeah. personnel. Well, so let, let, let me give them an opportunity to speak on that. Coming from the taxation office, if you generate revenue, that's taxable income. As Regardless. far as this office is concerned. Regardless. Well, Regardless. Is, the, is the key on this having the requirement for the business license? In other words, he wouldn't, his, he wouldn't to run to his brother-in-law, he wouldn't have to have a business license. That is correct. If he doesn't charge his brother-in-law to occupy his home while he's going through this uh, event that just happened in his life, then we would not we wouldn't even get involved with this because money does not exchange hands. So if your college-age kid is paying rent to live in your house, it sounds like you're supposed to be paying taxes. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> Mr. Branham. So the questions that I would have is, A, do we have some sort of rampant Airbnb problem where we have a bunch of uh, people with really bad homes and things like that and we've had numbers of safety issues that we need to address this and then the second question is why just the 30 days why wouldn't this apply to anybody if I rented out my house for regardless of the amount of time why does it matter if it's 30 days or not so uh, this is a pretty big um, difference here why are some people treated one way and some I think this is no. if you're isn't this is I mean you could rent it out for three days. Correct. I mean, this is saying up if it, to thirty days. Up it, thir but if I rent it more than thirty days, am, it, that's, a, that that's a whole different category. Yeah, that's different. I mean that's I know, but why? Because that's that's over that that's lodging. I mean, there's well, I'll let you talk about that. By huh? state statute, yeah, it's lodging. If you rent a property uh, that someone is using as transit living. Mm -hmm. The, um, and for some other reason, like the extended stay, they go beyond the 30 days. By law, on the 31st day, we cannot, they are not subject to hotel, motel, excise taxes. Right. But we will charge the occupation tax, and there is some exception to the rules for sales tax, but the Georgia Department of Revenue will have to act on that. So if they're going beyond the 31 days, that means that that is their abode, and that's where they live. Mm -hmm. so that's what but, and, that, and that's, that's that's still well beyond we're in the revenue portion of it. And I understand. Look, if you're if you're generating revenue, you need to be paying your mm -hmm. business tax. I mean, we're business people. Some you know have business licenses and whatnot. But like the permitting, the the, the forty dollar permit, getting the background checks, you know, inspections by codes and enforcement and stuff like that. And that's more on John's side. Why isn't this apply to those folks as well? And it's not a you know why wouldn't it apply beyond? That if you're renting a piece of property to someone, regardless of how long they stay there, this mm -hmm. describes everything you'd want, regardless if it's for one day or one year. But then you're verging mm -hmm. on what we call residential rental income. Yeah. And by, our, um, by Columbus Code, anyone who rent their, pro um, their property for residential stay, they are, not, they are exempt for, from occupation tax and business licensing. Mm -hmm. but, uh, I'm not even to that part yet. I'm on, the, I'm on getting this $40 license and permit. So I'm, I'm before you even get to your office. So I mean, right. it's a, this is the enforcement side of why, why is this only applying to one to 30 days, the, the first part, the, the rental Well, any, anything part. beyond that is under the property maintenance laws. So if anybody comes in and they're a tenant that lives in a property and they have deficiencies that are in their homes, they're more than welcome to call our office and then we inspect them and make sure at that point. When the property is built, it receives a certificate of completion. So at that point, it is done and it meets all codes unless any, um, any future alterations are made. And then once any alterations are made, we go back and inspect it at that point. So this is only to cover these short-term rentals where you're in, but any other rental agreement, if it's a tenant that's living in substandard conditions, they can come to our office and then we inspect. But at that point, then we go back to review when that permit was pulled, when it was built to make sure it met code at that time and check the floor plans, make sure any of those alterations weren't made. So anything after that point, we would check it anyway. But why wouldn't you, if you're renting it out, why wouldn't you, regardless of the length, why wouldn't you be, require them to get this, the permit, not the, not the license, the tax side, but the permit side? Why did not require everyone that rents out their property, regardless of the length, 
to get this permit. And I'm actually not, uh, this, I'm arguing this the wrong way, but, uh, and I also still would like to know if this is some huge problem that we've had where we've had a bunch of Airbnbs go bad in Columbus that we need well, this Well, I think in the very beginning regulation. he said that they're trying to get ahead of, you, you don't want to wait till it becomes a, a, a bad situation to address it. That's what he opened the, the statement by saying that. So I think that answers that question. But in terms of the other part of it, Yeah, let Mr. Uh, Mr. Kenner. Yeah, uh, can I pose another another case that I'm aware of right now that may you may be able to illustrate the difference between what Mr. Brennan is doing and in, in, in this case. In, in my in my neighborhood, there was a woman that died. Okay, her daughter doesn't want to sell the house right away, but she wants to have some income, so she wants to rent it out. Okay, and that would be for six months or a year or something like that. Okay, now. What applies to say what applies to that case that is different than what applies to this short term thing of thirty days or less? The length of stay. You guys are making this harder than it needs to be. It, the, the, it, when you if you are spending the night in a campground in someone's house or whatever for more than thirty days you jump into a residential category. You are no longer a temporary lodging situation am I right That's correct. so the in that situation if she puts that house up for rent as a residential place to rent and she has this lease that is signed for six months or a year or whatever that that takes her out of a for lack of a better word temporary lodging or a vacation category That's correct. I don't know if you want but to expand on that, that is correct but that that, that, that I understand, yes, I understand the mathematical difference between staying one night or 31 nights. And I understand that it's a difference, but these things that we're looking for, life safety, whether they've got a, a felony or something like that, why does it matter if, it, if somebody stays in your house for one night or 300 nights? Why, does, you, well, why you, wouldn't you, you apply these same things? Okay, to so let me stop you right there. It, correct me if I'm wrong. If, if Mr. Brannon has an Airbnb, and I want to come stay at his Airbnb. I'm not the one you're looking for the criminal background check on, right? No. That's where you're getting confused. No, no. I'm not confused no. about that either. We're all on the same page. Oh, well, yeah, you're, you're, I'm lost then because I, uh, you're asking why does that homeowner have to go by the, by the asking, criminal background the check? Simple question is why are you doing a background check on this owner and making him get a permit and making Rather him have than, all these okay. responsibilities? Okay when I am going to rent the house that I bought up the hill from me to a person for two years, but I have no responsibility gotcha. to that. And gotcha. they can have as much of a party, make as much noise, put as much trash on the street, use as many of the facilities they want to without having any requirements to be checked on. That is what we're saying. Gotcha. Which is why I'm having a major issue with the way this is, is written and put down. Gotcha. Now that is, makes that, does that clarify? You know, that clarifies it. I'm yeah. not an advocate for a, uh, Airbnb, but it seems like it's going to stop a lot of people from wanting to engage in this service. And I think that could be more harm to the city than mm -hmm. helpful if people want to come here and enjoy that type of lodging and not to be forced to stay in certain folks' hotels, but want to stay in a private home. Well, now we're preventing that. Uh, and in, in the good um, summary that Mr. Greenblatt gave, I really would like to hear that answer. Why, the, you know, the sum of it is, why are these permits okay. being required in a temporary situation and not in a permanent situation? If you were in a permanent situation and you were violating any of those rules, that would be a citation that we would issue regardless. No, what he's saying is, why are, why are, they, why are you require, requiring the background check on someone who's renting a room in their house for two weeks versus renting their house out for a year. Well, we'll have to get with the city attorney, but typically rental agreements and lease agreements between two private citizens are a separate situation. We were trying to cover anything that we deal with on a permitting side. So gotcha. if it comes in as a permit, then these are the requirements that are done. We don't check everyone's lease. If somebody's signing a place whenever they are, we don't see a copy of that lease. We're just trying to make sure subleases, especially if we're dealing with um, home occupations or, or home offices and home businesses, that's the only time the city ever sees a private lease because then we know that that homeowner has approved that person to do that type of work. So like I said, when it comes to the permitting side, two private citizens agreeing to a lease is, is nothing we would we would ever enter into and have to check on. But that's a, but that's what an Airbnb yeah. is. An Airbnb yeah. is simply a connecting service. The the agreements between two citizens, mm -hmm. not between 
me and Airbnb and the but and the there's owner. also no regulations at Airbnb on locally onto what's going on. There's, no, there's regulations no regulations there. to me but, but, what, right now. Then there's no regulations to me other than the typical what you're talking about. If my home's dilapidated, y'all can come look at it and mark it for uh, demolition and whatnot. But there's no regulation on me running out my house right now for more than 31 days. So I get and, and, and Director John, we're, we're certainly not. This is not against you guys. I mean, we're looking this at the policy. We're thing, certainly, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so well, it, it, I mean, it, 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 it just seems just like this. Here, so. It well, just seems like it's unnecessarily overly burdensome for someone trying to engage in a small rental of their property for under 30 days. Well, it, it, se it seems like this is a the the the. the 30 days or less, that is a regular reoccurring commercial enterprise. Yes. They're trying to get money, they're trying to get income, a dedicated income for a particular property on a recurring basis. Yes. Whereas uh, renting to the daughter, renting uh, uh, the house of her mother while she's settling the estate is not a, it's a, a money transaction, but it's not a commercial activity. Okay, in, in, the, in the case of, of regular income that, other, that the short-term rentals are trying to keep. That, that's the distinction I see. But some people, Mr. Karen, they, they do have multiple rental houses, mm -hmm. and they have mm -hmm. scores of rental that houses, and that I'm is a commercial mm -hmm. enterprise for them. Yeah. Right. And I would, I would argue the case that if I'm trying to rent a house, it is a commercial whether I have one or, or, or ten. Right. Only because you're trying to cover your expenses that Otherwise you Otherwise you wouldn't be charging rent. Exactly. <laughs> And I think it's the same different if you have a cottage and you're going to rent it by the week or by the month or whatever the case may be. So, and might I add, please? We're trying to, we're trying to put, we're trying to do this fairly across the board because these short-term rentals, they're in competition with our hotelers, and we make them abide by our rules, and they're collecting monies. Yeah, and so we're process. trying to have the short-term renters to abide by the same, almost the same rules as our hotelers. And they have, they have a true argument to say we're having to pay sales tax. We're having to pay 8% lodging tax. Yeah. We're having to pay occupation tax. I might as well go underground myself and do the same thing. So that's what we're trying to do, to make this equitable across the board as much as we can. So we make so, hotel owners go through a background check? No, we do not. So it's not the same then? We try to make it as equitable as we can across okay. the board, though. So would this would this apply to the hoteliers then? I'm sorry. Would this would this apply to the hoteliers? All of a sudden, the background checks. Except the... for the yes, ma'am. Except for the background check, they do pay the. Um, they have to obtain um, a health marshal slip from the health department. The health department get involved right. with hotels, but they're not getting involved with short-term rentals. They have, the, the hotelers have to obtain a certificate of occupancy from the uh, inspectors and codes office. In lieu of the certificate of occupancy, we're having them to get the, sh um, the short-term rental permit. And then after that, it's the same thing across the board. If, they, if that hoteler is in violation where they're not paying their taxes or didn't renew their business license, we send in special enforcement. The same thing is going to apply for our short-term rental people. And so the, I guess the idea is you're providing a, a short circuit for the one-off situations are for the small small business person the one family owner but what you're also telling me is that there are already laws on the books city and state that regulate short-term rentals that are where they're supposed to be paying their fees and stuff like that and we're just not enforcing it for whatever reason um which i know there's just we got a staff issue too that needs help but um there are already laws on the books so why add yet another layer of regulation they're supposed to be paying their hotel motel tax regardless of whether it's airbnb or or the hilton except i guess without the business license you don't know how to you can't well georgia is just getting to play with this because this is this is a hot topic across sure. the nation and in every city is trying to to wrap the, their heads around this what do we do and how do we be fair to our other business owners who operate hotels um, so this is the best thing that we can do. We looked at other cities as far as in, um, in Savannah mm -hmm. and um, even in New Orleans, and we tried to um, mimic what they put into play because it's already in action. And everything is a work, you know, in, in, in process as we go along to try to better this. But this is, this is what we've come up with just based on the information that we obtained from other cities throughout the United States. Mm -hmm. Sure. 
So I think um, if, I'm not going to try and repeat it all, but in summary, it sounds as if this is being brought forward to, um, lack of a better word, regulate appropriately um, operations in a, that are acting in a, as, as if they're in a hotel or lodging situation to bring them on board with getting a business license and being compliant with codes and enforcement so that we can also appropriately tax them. I mean, I think that that's it in a summary. I mean, I, re I realize the background check is a bone of contention. I, I hear that loud and clear. Um, I guess I'd be curious outside of the, the background check, is it still? Well, it's not just the background check. I mean, there's the, the fees, um, you know, just like, I mean, what, a decade ago when we were, when the city was fighting with Expedia or whoever it was to mm -hmm. collect the motel tax, mm -hmm. why not go after the Airbnb that's provided, because there's your central point that you could say, mm -hmm. look, you guys need to be remitting, if you're handling these transactions, right. you need to be remitting this money mm -hmm. back to the city. And um, be permanent, and properly it, permitted. Right. Well, and again, Airbnb is just a connection. Uh, you know, I, I just have a problem with it restricting an economy. It's another layer of bureaucracy and red tape. Uh, if somebody in in Columbus, you know, they're trying to get ahead and they want to rent out their room on a short-term basis because they've got a nice or a place downtown and that helps them get ahead, this is just one more thing. I mean, just, all of these steps here and again there's already laws you're if you're under 30 days you're supposed to be following the hotel laws mm -hmm. i mean that's regard so this is just adding yet another layer to what already exists and it sounds like we've got i don't want to say a problem because we i know john's working really hard and is short staffed they don't have enough people to go around and and check up on this them. yeah so we're okay. adding an extra layer of burden for laws that already exist gotcha. um any other comments amongst the commissioners, comments or questions? Uh, is there anyone in the audience who would like to speak in favor of this text amendment? I don't see anybody coming forward. Anyone who would like to speak against it? If I do not see anyone, which I don't, um, do I have a, um, a motion on this text amendment? Any motion? <laughs> No motion. Is there a motion to deny this text amendment? Mr. Greenblatt. Yes, regarding uh, REZN 07-18-1397, text amendment change to the UDO, I move that we do not approve. And so I have a second. So this, um, what has been brought forward is a motion to deny the approval of the text amendment and a second has been brought forward to deny the approval of the text amendment. All those in favor of denying the tax amendment, uh, text amendment, please raise your right hand. Okay, so it is unanimous to deny it. So we will um, submit a request for denial of this uh, text amendment. Thank you. Um, I don't see any other new business um, on our schedule? Is there anything, any announcements that need to be made? Nope, that's it. Next meeting on the 14th. All right, thank you so much. We are adjourned.